I actually wrote when I was on safari in, in South Africa. It was just a, a melody that I heard and came up with the, the chorus melody line. One of those kind of songs that's got a lot of different parts and how they tie together was really important. But it came out, it came out really nice and I'm, I'm really proud of it. Rivers Rising is um, the newest song that I wrote on the record. Most of the material was written like around 2018 and 19, but right before we went into pre-production, I just made up this riff and, and it turned into Rivers Rising. And so it's the, the most recent written song on the, on the record. And it's, it's you know, it's, it's uh, something that came together uh, in my little studio in LA and it was just very spontaneous. I can't even remember how it all came together. It came together really quickly, but uh, it rocks. And, and I thought it would be a good, a good track for the opening of the record. This track was interesting in the sense that when I got it from Slash, the, the, the basic demo, it just grabs you right out of the gate. You know, it's like a real proclamation. Because it actually, one point, wasn't even considered as, as a contender, believe it or not. It's, that's a funny thing with the songs. It's like when we were trying to figure out what the, what the first 10 were going to be. That I don't know if that was on the list. So I'm glad it made it. And, and, and it's basically, from a theme standpoint, about kind of that cult of personality and how that affects people. And um, just that you've seen throughout history. So it's a, that's kind of a a timeless theme, you know, that uh, always rears its ugly head. I love the, the riff and the grind, and it was something that I definitely heard in my head, and it took me a while to figure out exactly what it was that I was hearing, because it has this sort of more of a stomp nature to it than it actually had notes. But once I figured it all out, um, it's a real simple arrangement, and it's really just focused on that riff. This track, it's funny when you listen to the lyrics, you, you probably think it's about um, maybe some sort of, I don't know, it's got kind of this nasty vibe, right? And, and it definitely has a, the groove and the, 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 uh, the overall vibe of the song it might not be as congruent with the lyric because what the lyric is actually about is, uh, is all these day traders on Robin Hood. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, but I thought it would be really interesting to try and tell a story. Like, because you see how people are so addicted to their, to their phones and to their apps. And I thought, well, what if you, you made it kind of fall in line with that, but instead of it being obvious, like about a, like a sexual relationship or something, it was more just your obsession with Robin Hood. <laughs> Say La Vie has been around for a little bit. I think uh, first started working on that riff on the uh, Live in the Dream tour. And we a lot of stuff gets written in hotel rooms and then we work on it at sound checks. That's been pretty much the nature of how we do things. And that particular riff came up in some hotel room. I can't remember what city or what country. And then it started to develop over the course of sound checks from that point on. And then um, during the pandemic, when I started putting demos together, that was one of the things I definitely wanted to revisit. And I put the voice box on it and it just sort of came together. Say la vie. So that song, it's one of the first songs that we had um, from the Live in the Dream Tour. I remember we were working on that in a venue. It was, it's funny because a lot of times I can, when I hear the songs, I remember the genesis of the, of the, the you know, the moment that we started playing it together. And I think we were in like Poland or somewhere in a, like an empty arena and started jamming on the, on the riff. And so it, it's fun to see how that's, come together over the years because it was, it's, it's something that um, you never know when you're first jamming where, where things will go. Um, but the, the narrative ended up being about um, somebody kind of, or essentially finding the strength to move on 
so like you could be like in an abusive relationship or something that's just not healthy and it's that that, that moment where you you take charge and you decide to move on with your life I think Pathless Followed is uh, a piece of music that's might be the oldest song on the record. Um, it was a melody that was just stuck in my head. And uh, I think I, I originally showed it to the guys. It might, ev it might even have been at the tail end of recording um, Live in the Dream. And it's just something that I've been wanting to see materialize. And when I finally started putting together demos for um, this record for our fourth record um revisited that and and finally got it together and sent it to miles and here it is it's it's almost a continuation of a song we had um the last record called boulevard of broken dreams which uh, is essentially words of advice for anybody who wants to follow their bliss be it get in the music industry or the entertainment entertainment industry or just anything that is is not the status quo, where you're doing something where you're, you're following your heart and you're doing something that um, you have to do. It's something, you know, there's like someone told me a long time ago, they said, be a musician because you have to be a musician, not because you want to. And it's the idea that if you're going to take that chance and essentially, you know, march to the beat of your own drummer, that it's a, it's a long, hard road but uh, in the end, it's worth it. Actions speak, speak louder than words. I remember the origin of this was uh, in South America and we were in Brazil and I'd come up with the, the melody and then started working on it at Soundcheck. So through the song arrangement developed over every country in uh, South America that we played on the on the uh, Live in the Dream tour. So like Brazil, Sao Paulo, uh, Brasilia, Argentina, Chile, all these different countries, that, that thing was slowly but surely coming together. That's another one that's older. That's another one that I can remember. We were in empty arenas all over the world as that was kind of coming to, coming to life. And um, once again, it's a, it's a song that took a few different turns, a few different arrangements until we finally, I think we're, we're, we're comfortable with it. So it was cool when Slash started putting the demos together and then it was solidified even more. Um, by that point, I had had enough distance from it where I could have a fresh perspective and that's really important because sometimes when you're working on songs, you get so immersed in the, in the process that you, you aren't able to look at it from 30,000 feet. So when he sent the the final arrangement, it was it was really easy to just go, oh, you know, any any melodic uh, concerns I might have had, I had, a, I had that fresh perspective where I could go, oh, this melody here is fine, this is great. And it was done really quickly, uh, just a, like a day, so. Spirit Love is just a pseudo Middle Eastern kind of grind, <laughs> you know? Um, it it started with the started with the intro and that just influenced the rest of the the rest of the song and i just it's another one of my favorite ones on the record spirit love is a song that tells a story of someone who thinks that they're having a relationship with someone or something in kind of the spirit realm like a ghost <laughs> but as the narrative progresses they realize that uh, they've actually cross to the other side as well so that's I have no idea where that came from sometimes <laughs> I'm like I'm a twisted man a strange human being fill my world is uh, a, a really simple little melody thing that I came up with and put together pretty much the entire arrangement um, over the course of one sitting and uh, it's sort of a mid-tempo ballad kind of a thing but um miles really put a gorgeous melody over the top of it that's really what made the song happen for me that's probably my favorite track on the record and it was about i don't know it was a few years ago and i was on the road and my wife she comes out and visits me and we oftentimes will leave our dog Mozart, his little shih tzu, with, with friends or with the, the pet sitter or whatever. And, and 
so they had dropped him off at the house to be unattended for a little while, but my wife was supposed to get home, you know, to take care of him. Well, the storm rolled in, so she couldn't get home, and all we had were the, the cams inside the house just to keep an eye on how he was doing. And so we watched it. It was heartbreaking as the night progressed. You know, the storm was getting really, in, really intense, and he's super sensitive to storms, and, and we always have trees and branches that'll hit the house during those storms, and it really freaks him out. So he was panicking. I mean, he, it was actually... It was, it was kind of heartbreaking. And so I thought that song would be written from his perspective. It, like all the things, if he could articulate it, that he would have said during that horrible night. And uh, so it's, it's interesting because when I sing that song now, and even when my wife heard it, you know, she kind of teared up because you can you can see that you can see just the pan, the panic. I mean, it's a dog, and and so people might think, oh, you know, maybe if you're not a dog lover, you're not going to get it. But if you're a real dog lover, there's a certain empathy. Your, your canine empathy will kick in when you hear that song. <laughs> April Fool has another song that's been around since the uh, Live in the Dream tour. Um, it went through, I mean, it was a cool riff and a cool arrangement all the way up until we went into the studio and then we actually toyed around with it for a second and it came out really good. Um, but it's the, the, the original inception was back in 2019. That's another one of my favorite tracks on the record. I feel like the overall vibe of it and the, the I was real happy with the melody. That was one of those melodies where it, it sticks in your head and that's, that's important. Um, I wanted to have a certain hook element. But as far as the lyric goes, it's really, and we've all been there, where you, you're in a situation, there's a dynamic with another human being or, or whatever, where you're always kind of playing the fool. Um, and this song touches on that and the idea that at the end, ultimately, you know, you have the last laugh. So it's something we all can relate to and all hope to see one day. Uh, Call of the Dogs is one of the newer songs on the on the record, and it was really when we first go into the studio to start pre-production, we I always come up with something that we can jam on, and this was that particular riff that I just came up with in the spur of the moment that we could just fall into and start playing. Cause sometimes you can get into to the room together, and if you start thinking about what you're going to play, you can stand there for an hour. <laughs> trying to figure it out. So I always make up something so we can just kick into gear right away. Slash sent the demo, and I really liked the overall vibe of it. I just felt like it needed a chorus, kind of like um, River Rising, where it was like this really great groove and one of his signature riffs. And so took it and cut out like eight or 16 bars, whatever it was, put some drums down and played a guitar part and bass and whatnot, added a melody. And send it back to him real quick, and this is the this is the beauty of technology. Is you can do that, and we were twelve hundred miles away from each other, and said, "Hey, you know, let's. What do you think of bringing this section in for a, for a possible chorus?" And he was totally cool. I mean, that's the thing that I love about working with him is he's he's always been that way, where he's open to whatever as long as it serves the song. So that's uh, that song is definitely another uh, example of that. Every time I hear it, yeah, fall back to earth. Um... I actually wrote when I was on safari in, in South Africa in 2019. It was just a, a melody that I heard and I had taken my guitar to Africa with me and, uh, and came up with the, the chorus melody line and then uh, put together some of the verse parts and, and whatnot. And it took a while to really sort of get to where the arrangement is now because it's one of those kind of songs that's got a lot of different parts and how they tie together was really important. But it came out, it came out really nice. I'm, I'm really proud of it. That is a track that to me when I hear it is very, has elements of, of like the signature Slash thing, like that melody. That's, that's, that is Slash in a nutshell. And that's what he does. Um, it's one of my favorite things that he has in his bag of tricks as a guitar player and as a musician, as a writer. Um, as far as 
what I tried to bring to the table on that. Um, it's definitely now that I hear it once it's done, I can definitely hear my appreciation and respect for David Bowie. It's definitely got Bowie elements. Um, and I think that the, the lyric is something that I've seen time and time again in this industry where people gain the world and then lose themselves in the process. And so this touches on that and the idea that, you know, as, when you, as we all, you, you rise and you fall, that there's someone there that'll catch you in the end. There's, there, there'll be that, you know, looking at it from a friend's perspective and seeing somebody who's falling into the rock and roll cliche and letting them know that I'm, I'm, I got your back, you're gonna be all right. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. Did you like that video? You can check out more over here. And don't forget to subscribe to iHeart right here. And if you're already a longtime fan, make sure you ring the bell down below so you don't miss a single video. Bye guys.